grace and peace to you from him who is, who was, and who is to come. Amen. For our sermon text this morning, we read select verses from Hebrews chapter 11. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. This is God's word. Please be seated. Dear brothers and sisters, walking through this world by faith and not by sight. There is a television program that's been on so long that I can just barely remember a time when it wasn't on the air. That program is Survivor. Now, I'll admit, I'm not a big Survivor fan myself, not a big fan of reality TV in general. I have my own reality, thank you very much. But you, you have to admit that the show has an interesting premise. Take a handful of people from all different walks of life, different genders, from mechanics to millionaires, put them in a secluded spot, and see which of them doesn't crack first under the pressure. Who doesn't give up under the strain of mental and physical challenges and all that on a starvation diet? I'll admit, the first time I actually watched the show, I thought, whoever wins this thing better get at least a million dollars. When I found out it was only $500,000, I thought, these people are nuts. Who would give up time with their family, be totally cut off from them, risk your life, risk your health. And yet, my evaluation aside, the contestants just keep on coming. They do so in the tiniest hope of winning that ultimate prize, of getting that title of sole survivor. I guess you can put up with just about anything so long as you have the right perspective. The writers of the Hebrews this morning use the life of Moses to illustrate to you and I that as Christians, God has given us a unique perspective. One that no one else in this world has. And one that is under attack each and every day. May the Holy Spirit enlighten our minds and open our eyes to see how faith gives us a new perspective on life by focusing our attention on the promises of God. Now, that word faith, it's kind of a nebulous word in our society. If you went and asked someone on the street, use the word faith in a sentence, they might say, well, I have faith that my son will do the right thing. But by faith there, they kind of just mean hope, and, and even that's not all too sure. But God doesn't use such wishy-washy terminology in his definition of faith. He says, faith is being sure of what you hope for and certain of what we do not see. At its essence, faith is trust. Faith is certainty. It's confidence. But we see in those words things that make our human reason just a little bit uneasy. Sure of what we hope for? Certain of what we do not see? Are you serious? See, it's our natural inclination to find security in things that can be felt, that can be measured, that can be grabbed, that are right here, right now. It was a reasonable, logical mind that said, a bird in the hand is much better than two in the bush. Well, now, if you're someone who happens to think that way, just reflect for a moment on just how many things in life you believe 
without any first-hand knowledge of any kind. Has any of you ever actually met Alexander the Great or Leonardo da Vinci? Do you believe your wife when she says, the milk is spoiled, or the kids have been good today? See, it would be impossible for us to live our lives without relying on what others have told and promised us. But we don't want to go in the other extreme either and say, as some do, that faith is the total opposite of reason. It's the, the lack and the absence of reason. Some say faith is blind. Well, if by blind they mean that faith trusts without knowing the outcome, fine. But let's not get into our heads that faith being blind, that faith trusting simply means some senseless, baseless, pie-in-the-sky confidence. No, the faith that God gives us can be 100% sure. Because faith's object is sure and secure. The context of Hebrews chapter 11 tells us exactly what faith looks to. What these unseen and unknown things are. These are the very promises of God. They may not be realized yet, but God says they're coming. Faith clings to the promises of our almighty and all-loving God. A God who does not lie, who's not a man who changes his mind, who keeps his promises even to the bitter end, no matter what it costs him. Even if it costs him the suffering and death of his only son. Faith transforms our view on God's promises. Faith takes and says, this is real, I have it. God has said it. It is as good as done. Now, the word that the writer uses for certainty literally means the title deed. You homeowners know that little piece of paper, that precious piece of paper that you put in your safe or security deposit box. The one that says, this house is mine. Now, whoever owns the title owns the property, no matter what anyone else may say. That's what faith is. That's what faith does. Faith appropriates the promises of God for itself, for its very own. Now, a beggar may not even have a cent to his name. But if he has the deed to a luxury Beverly Hills estate. He is truly rich indeed. My friends, it's the same for us. We may be ever so weak, ever so lonely, ever so despised by this world, but that faith that God has given us, whether it clings to the promises of God with a fist or a fingernail, has what God promises. Now that we know a little more about what faith is and better understand that, we can now follow the writer to the Hebrews as he illustrates how faith transforms living by using the life of Moses. But first, let's just quickly review Moses' life where we find him in our text. Moses was born around 1500 B.C. If you remember, he was born into some pretty dangerous circumstances. Yes, his people, the Hebrew people, were enslaved in Egypt. And now the king of Egypt, Pharaoh, had grown afraid of them. Because of their increasing numbers, he decided he had to use drastic measures. So he said, this people are going to rebel unless we cut down their size. So he said, from this day on, every male child born to the Hebrews will be put to death. Now Moses' parents and the majority of the Israelites didn't follow such a godless law. Moses' parents took and they hid their newborn baby boy in a, in a basket of reeds and put him in the Nile. Now maybe you remember from your elementary school or from your Sunday school lessons how Moses' daughter, or Pharaoh's daughter, came by. She heard the baby crying. She went to the basket. She took him out and she had pity on him. She realized just who he was. So then she paid Moses' mother to nurse him, take care of him. We got a little bit older, then she took him into the palace as her own 
Son. Now, put yourself in Moses' sandals for a moment. As the son of Pharaoh's daughter, he was part of the elite Egyptian nobility. He had access to the finest food, clothes, education. He had all the attention he could possibly get in a time when there was no Social Security or Medicare. He had a first-class ticket to a cushy life when everyone else was sitting there starving, working themselves to death just to survive. And as royalty, he had power and prestige and charisma. Like some ancient prince, Harry, he lived a life where no sin was far beyond his reach. Be that wine or women or whatever he would have wanted. By worldly standards, Moses had it all. Now ask anyone out there. No, ask anyone sitting right here. Is there a little part of you that says that Moses would be an absolute fool to give that up? Isn't there a part of you that says he must be an incredible idiot if he's going to identify with an enslaved people whom Pharaoh is pushing slowly to the brink of annihilation? How could he do it? Why would he do it? By faith. By faith, that is exactly what Moses did. Faith transformed his perspective on persecution, on shame, and on the pleasures of this sinful world. The writer of the Hebrews now puts it this way. He says, By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. Now evidently Moses' mother made the most of her time with her young son. She taught him who he was, who the true God was. Most importantly, she taught him by faith to look ahead, to see that promise deliverer for the whole world from the slavery of sin and death, the one that we've come to know as Jesus Christ. By faith, Moses, when he grew up, made his decision to identify with these people out of full knowledge. He did so. He chose to be persecuted along with the people of God. Now Moses wasn't like some child of a celebrity who changes their name because he just got sick of the limelight and the attention and couldn't handle it anymore. No. He chose to be persecuted with people of God because he saw what was ahead. By faith, he saw that the pleasures of Egypt and the sinful treasures that were around him were just temporary trinkets that dazzled the eyes, but in the end led to eternal death. Moses willingly embraced shame and suffering because by faith he saw his Savior, the one who would bear the world's shame and suffer the torments of hell on the cross for him and for us all. Now Moses could do this not because of his strong and resolute will and because, or because he had faith in his faith that it was so strong. He did so because he was looking ahead to his reward. Now that word looking ahead in there literally means that he was looking away from. Now that's kind of a weird picture for us to understand. What do you mean looking away from? Well, picture Moses sitting there with all the gold, all the glory, all the vices of Egypt staring him in the face. And yet by faith he could look away from, he could look around, he could look ahead to his heavenly reward. My dear Christians, how are you doing bearing the reproach of Christ? 
because it never has been and never will be an honorable thing to be a child of God and follow his ways. That's what baby Hugh was baptized into this morning. Not a life of glory, not a life of good things and praise from this world. He was baptized into the life of the redeemed. Of those who are God's children, but who, as God's children, bear that shame, bear that ridicule, because they know they have lasting possession. Now what's worse is not only that the world puts this pressure on us, but that it also holds out all its sin and vices to replace that suffering that we endure for the sake of Christ. Sin calls to us and says, why would you want to live that way? Why would you want to go through all that? Much better just to seize what's yours. Much better to steal, much better to cheat, because no one ever got ahead by leading a pure and chaste life. Much better to give up and live a promiscuous life rather than live purely. Because then you can enjoy all the pleasures, all the fun, and have all the popularity that goes right along with it. My friends, the sad thing is that every time we give in to sin, every time we follow our sinful nature as it tries to dazzle us and lead us down to that mirage, momentary pleasures, every time we give in to the ways of the world, we are in fact closing our eyes to the eternal promises that God has given us. Worst part, part about it is that we have no excuse. We know who Jesus is. We know that in him we have greater treasures than his forgiveness redemption and peace than this world could ever offer us. And yet without any good reason at all, we follow the lies. Such horrible God-denying lies and we lose our sight, our perspective on eternal life. The writer of the Hebrews several verses after this gives us the only solution to our predicament. It's not by us trying harder. Rather, he says, fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the glory and majesty of God. Jesus never lost sight of God's will. He never gave in to the pressure to be an earthly king or massaged his message to make it more palatable to the masses. Jesus never gave in to the lies of Satan and resisted the temptations of this world. And he did so willingly. He willingly went to the cross, even scorning its shame and its humiliation. And why? Because by faith, he saw the joy set before him. He saw that he would sit at the right hand of the majesty of God in heaven. So dear Christians, what are you looking at? By faith, look away from, look around, look ahead from all those pressures and pleasures of sin that are screaming out for your attention day after day. Look to your Savior Jesus and the heaven that he is won for you. A heaven where there will be no more weakness, no more crying, no more pain, no sickness, no more struggling with our sinful nature, no more death, none of it at all. It will all be replaced by perfect joy, with peace, with holiness that will be ours then and forevermore along with Moses and all the faithful who have gone before us. Look ahead. Look to that city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God himself. Long for a better country, 
a heavenly one. But until that day comes, live your lives transformed by your faith in God's promises. Encourage one another. And when someone comes to you and says, how can you live with such confidence? How can you live with such boldness in this life and the next? So if they wonder what you're even looking at, point them to Jesus. Point them to the heaven that he has prepared for us all. Amen. Please stand.